Well, you want me to start. Maybe 1922 is a good time to start, well before I was born. My father uh, was uh, an orphan, actually, and he was wounded during World War uh, I. One of his brothers was killed in the artillery. He was wounded and lay on the battlefield uh, near the end of the war, and some nuns found him, and he was still moaning. They said, oh, there's one alive here. And they took him in and, uh, and uh, cured him uh, in their, at the monastery. How, how and old was he and what was his name? My, his name was Irvin Victor Winston. No, Irvin Victor Weichmann was his name. Weichmann with two N's at the end. And uh, he, uh, he had basically lived through World War I. He was an orphan. Uh, he was with a family, lived with a family named Bogan, uh, who had three uh, stepbrothers, uh, and one of them was killed. And uh, one of them uh, came to the, eventually got to the United States. He was in, he, and one of them um, committed suicide. I would think he was homosexual. So basically, uh, that's uh, starting the story in 1922 because he became a fairly successful businessman in uh, a little town called Gleivitz, now called Glavitzi, uh, in, in uh, Oberschlesien, Upper Silesia. Uh, of uh, Germany, uh, with mostly Germans living in this area, but this area moved back and forth between Poland and, uh, and Germany, and is now a third part of Germany that was given to Poland to compensate them for, the, uh, uh, for losing part of Poland to Russia. So uh, we're rather unhappy about that because uh, the German Jews that were got out of, that lived there, were not particularly compensated for, they didn't get their properties back and were not compensated for uh, many of the things. Uh, my father did get Social Security from the Germans, which made it very nice. And then in, in the late, uh, when he got older, he got two Social Security checks, one from Germany and one from, uh, from but in 1922 he built a very, very modern, he hired an architect, uh, friend, uh, Eric Mendelssohn, and built a modern uh, fabric store in 1922 in this little German city of Gleivitz. Uh, how he kept, I, how he raised the money to build this, it's, um, but that store is still alive, uh, still standing there. It's uh, now a, uh, uh, a bookstore. Uh, uh, I went there when I went visited Krakow a few a number of years ago. Anyway, uh, 1922, he was became a successful businessman. Came to the United States, 1926, and met a, an old gentleman on the boat, and he says, "I came to the United States to see what it's like." And this gentleman says, why don't you come to St. Louis with me? I have a son that's ready to make a little trip around the United States. My father says, sure. And he comes to St. Louis, which, by the way, at that time was the seventh or eighth largest city in the United States. People forget that. Uh, but it was a major city. Uh, and he and this uh, gentleman, Greenwald, uh, Milton Greenwald, went to the biggest cities in the United States, they went to Chicago, and then they went to Detroit, they went to Niagara Falls, they went to, of course, they went to New York, and they went to uh, Atlantic City. So they spent a little bit of time traveling the country, I don't remember exactly how long, maybe a month, I don't. Anyway, that's the story of my father, who was born in 1891, so he's uh, already on an age, not married. He marries in 1929, he marries my mother, Alice Richter, um, who lived in a town about 10 miles away called Hindenburg, uh, named after the old German general Hindenburg. And he, this was a, a nice marriage of two successful uh, people. They had a little, 
Actually, my mother had a little bigger store uh, with her, which she ran, uh, her grandmother and mother ran in Hindenburg called Heilborn, H-E-I-L-B-O-R, Heilborn. And uh, it was a little junior department store. And uh, af in, uh, well, they got married in 1929, and I was born in 1931. And I moved into, my, with my parents, I, in, the, in, this, in this bachelor apartment uh, above his store in Gleivitz. And we lived there, I presume, for about two years, three years, 1933, Hitler takes over. And right away, one of the first things he says, don't buy from Jews. And he had the, uh, so my father had partners. They were Gentile partners. And I never heard him complain. They purchased his share of the business. And uh, he never complained about what they gave him for the business. And he uh, soon moved to Hindenburg to run the business that my mother had. Uh, it was, uh, but to show you how foolish even the Jews were at that time, he insisted on modernizing the store, put in quite a bit of money in the facade and uh, a major renovation, making the store more modern. Uh, why one would do that, that shows us that, that most Jews uh, until 35, 36 didn't believe what was happening. And uh, I remember moving into an apartment in, uh, in, in uh, Hindenburg and uh, having a garden plot and so on, sandbox. Uh, everybody that lived in this apartment house had a, oh, I'd say an area by 25 by 24 for, for there to grow something if they wanted to, for their kids. Uh, eventually we moved in above the store in uh, Hindenburg. I'll try and get you well, a picture of that. Do you edit some of this? Yes, sure. Good, yeah. okay. Um, uh, anyway, um, we lived there a, no a number of years. So my, my mother did have a brother, but he had already gone to Australia with his family, one son and a wife. And, uh, I, and, and we lived, and my mother now had a second child, uh, my sister Vera. And my sister Vera married a Dr. Prop here in St. Louis, uh, we, where we moved in 1938. We finally got to St. Louis. We, got to, we, we packed, I still remember packing uh, goods of all sorts because that was still allowed. Early 38, you could take just about everything. As I remember, the restriction was women could only have one diamond ring and uh, one fur coat. Uh, and, uh, but other, other than that, we came over here with uh, enough clothing to last a few, two or three or four years. We came over with a house full of furniture, a new refrigerator, a stove, uh, you know, that, all, everything that worked in the United States, including a Mercedes automobile. A small Mercedes car came with us too in the large crates. So that was still allowed. Money uh, was still allowed a certain amount. I am guessing almost $10,000 was allowed uh, to be taken out. And uh, it took us quite a while to get to, the, uh, to St. Louis. We knew we were going here. We, I remember he sh once looking at the tickets. Uh, we're on a long stub uh, that went to the floor because we first went to England. Then from England we flew to Paris. I flew in an airplane, uh, very disappointed because I couldn't see the, the ground. Uh, it was foggy over the Ch English Channel. Then we took a, a train to Le Havre, where we got on uh, the Cunard White Star Line, Georgic, uh, traveling first class. I remember I had my seventh birthday on the plane, on the, tra on the ship, and uh, I had a little, the, the waiter gave me a little doll. Uh, like a, a little wooden doll, and then I was quite happy. And when I got to New York, we met uh, Milton, 
Uncle Milton and got on a train and came to St. Louis. Lived at the Parkage Hotel, Motel, Hotel, uh, no, it's really an apartment uh, uh, hotel, uh, right on uh, uh, Forest Park in Euclid. And we lived there for about a month looking for a house. And actually maybe our, uh, the fact that we had a stove and had a refrigerator sort of limited what we were, what we were looking for. But uh, we found a, 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 la a fairly large apartment with uh, four or five rooms in it uh, on Waterman Avenue, 5200 block of Waterman. Uh, so, uh, and my father was determined. He did not want to go to work for anybody else. And for a year we lived on what, he was, what we brought over here, uh, less what he had to invest, and found a partner that was also interested, another Jewish man, a Mr. Rosen, who invested in a, in a business, a fabric business, on Maryland Avenue near the parks of the Park Plaza, a very exclusive new area in St. Louis. And, uh, the store was, everybody warned them against this. They says, nobody buys fabrics in this country. Uh, they buy ready-to-made clothes. Uh, he's a stubborn man, and he was. He started um, a fabric store and uh, was quite successful at it, especially during the war when he had to go to New York often to beg for merchandise to sell at the store and try and get good merchandise because we wanted uh, to be the best. He wanted to be the best fabric store in the city of St. Louis. And so we did that. He did that. He went often. And my mother got into business as soon as uh, I started going to school. Um, that would be, I, I was already seven. So actually, they put me in uh, afternoon kindergarten. The very bottom is where they put me, who didn't know a word of, of, of English. And I taught the teachers German, and they taught me English. So I, I told them where the katze was, where the koo was, and they taught me how what a, what a cow and a, and a cat was. And uh, that went on for about, oh, a month or two, and then I got promoted to morning kindergarten. And that was nice, because I didn't have to take the naps anymore in the afternoon. So uh, then I very quickly went to Clark School, walked to Clark School with my mother for a, a while, but she joined my father in the business shortly, uh, not long after he started it in 1939. He started his business, uh, Winston's Fabrics. Uh, when, so, uh, and then she went to work with him. Um, anyway, I graduated from uh, grade school, getting a lot of double promotions, because I started two, late, two years late, and got there, got out of there on time, and did quite well. At, I was a good student, enjoyed learning. I didn't like some of the clothes I had to work at first because they were the German style clothes, and I nearly froze in them. Uh, uh, short pants even in winter time, and the teachers wouldn't let me in the school early. One time I snuck in. And they caught me, and I had to back out into the cold winter, January, February, in my short pants. So uh, I was so happy when I could buy a pair of knickers, which is what all my kids, the, the fellow students, wore knickers in the winter. Uh, I enjoyed being uh, with them. Like I say, I had a good time in school. Um, I went, started going to high school, and also, uh, which was Soldan, which was right next door. And again, I had to walk, oh, six, seven blocks all the way from Waterman to, uh, to uh, where the Clark and Soldan were. And uh, meanwhile, the fortunate thing also was the Y. Y-M-H-A, Y-M-W, Y-W-H-A was on the way home, right on uh, Union Boulevard, where the schools were, and I lived right near Union Boulevard. So for a long time, I, every night I'd go, every afternoon I'd go to the Y to play basketball or softball or, or so on. I had, they were very nice. They gave us 
They gave me a, a discount membership at the Federation, at the Y, Jewish Federation. I guess it was called that at that time, or the Y, I don't remember. But um, anyway, I lived there. When I was on my 10th birthday, uh, somebody came up to me and said, would you like to go to Camp Hawthorne? That was the Y camp in the Ozarks. And I said, oh, it's my birthday. You can't tell you how happy you've made me asking me to go there. I ran home. My parents said, okay, you can go to Camp Hawthorne. I think it was just for two weeks. And I went to Camp Hawthorne and went there then uh, paying my own way uh, for four years at least. Uh, I was, uh, I certainly enjoyed that. Uh, bought a turtle home one time. Somehow the turtle either escaped or somebody took it for turtle soup out of my backyard. I lived in this, uh, in this uh, uh, can't call it a duplex, a four-family apartment house on Waterman. My parents lived there until the 60s. They stayed in, so they were there for at least 20 years. Um, and in 1948, I graduated from Seoul Ann. I did quite well. I graduated in three and a half years, so now I'm just not even uh, 17. I was just 16. I got out of, and my father had made up his mind. He said, okay, ask in New York, what's the best fa textile school in the country? And everybody told him, Philadelphia Textile Institute in Pennsylvania is the best school. Uh, talking, I'm going back now, I just remember this is an uh, interview for the Holocaust, it's not just about me. And I remember I was only hit one time in Germany. I went to, and I recently missed the most important part. Why am I in the United States? It's not because my father had tremendous foresight, uh, but I was old enough to go to school, five years old in Hindenburg, old enough to go to school. By that time, school was no longer open to Jews. And I had to go to a little school, uh, one room schoolhouse at the synagogue with about, I'd say, 30 to 40 kids. And it was grades one through eight. And uh, we went there to school and I, uh, very primitive sort of a, a school, but with that many kids in it. And uh, what else? Uh, I remember the black inkwell, and I remember the teachers were more like in the Catholic schools. You were bad, you had to hold out your hand, and they hit you with a whip. Uh, I never was hit. I was too scared to be whipped, but I remember some other kids that spilled some ink, and uh, they were whipped, and I felt very bad for them. But that was basically when that happened. Uh, they were, what's going to happen to my children? My, Erwin and Alice said, what's going to happen to my children uh, if you can't get an education? Because my father often said to me, uh, the one thing they can't take away from you is your edu what you know or what you got in your head. So this is 1936. Uh, this is 19, uh, no, it has to be 1935. I went to school, or uh, 36 or so. Went to school for two years, okay, uh, in Germany. And did they, now at this point, did they say you couldn't attend the school any longer? I, could, no, I couldn't attend the public schools, okay. which they had gone through uh, very successfully. And uh, my father even went to sort of uh, junior college for a year, uh, uh, a trade school. A trade school is what the, the word I would use, trade school for a year. So this is the why he suddenly decided to leave. And they got this. And he, he had already been in, in the. In, in this kind of for a short visit with this Greenwald. So he called, uh, he didn't call, he didn't call in those days, sent, uh, can you get me a visa to come to the United States? And nine, this is not 1936 or so. Yeah, it is 36. Uh, and he sure did. He got us, because you had to have somebody that's fairly wealthy that could guarantee that we wouldn't go on welfare. And, uh, uh, and, and, so he, and he had enough political clout to get us a visa to come. And so that's why I say, uh, if you want me to, I can start over my, my United States thing. We're gonna, we'll, we'll 
I'll edit this. You edit this. Oh, you have a good time. Um, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, I went through school in 50, 1948. Then I went to Philadelphia Textile Institute in Philadelphia. Went on, just uh, barely 17 years old. Uh, it's probably one of the youngest in the in the in the school, uh, filled with GIs, kids twenty uh, kids that were 25, 24, 22, uh, had a sort of an exciting enlightenment in Philadelphia. All of a sudden, I saw a black and white walking down the street holding hands. Uh, all of a sudden, I went to movie theaters. Black and whites were in the same theater. I never my experience in St. Louis was not about segregation so much because they didn't have to ride on a different part of the bus or anything. So I just thought, well, they don't go to the same school because they don't live in the same district. We do. So that's why the, uh, there's no blacks in my school. And uh, there are no blacks at my movies because there are not too many of them live anywhere near here. And uh, so I never thought, thought anything about it until my father came home one day shocked because he has sort of a black porter working for him, took him downtown and said, well, let's go have something to eat. And he couldn't walk. And he says, I can't eat here. What do you mean you can't eat here? My father didn't realize that there were people that were segregated, that there, there, there was segregation even in St. Louis. So, uh, um, that sort of talks about that and the fact I graduated from uh, Philadelphia Textile nicely, so ask me some well, questions. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to ask you some questions, okay? First, let's give me memories of your childhood in Germany, you know, because it there, sounds like you were happy, you had everything. Absolutely. I was hit one time, uh, walking down the street about a block from our store. Some people picked me up and took me to the store. Uh, so the, some kid, I, uh, somebody on the, on the street, you see this was like downtown of this little city, uh, uh, Hindenburg, and somebody smacked me, as a, called me a dirty Jew, probably in, in, in German, which uh, I don't know what the curse word was that for Juden. Um, obviously I knew that, but I didn't know, I don't know, I can't remember if he said dirty Jew or anything, I just remember being, that's the only time. Uh, of course, that happened in this country. I, yeah. It didn't happen to me, but friends I had the same age I was walked by a Catholic school, and you had to worry about getting smacked or right. chased so, down the street. So you were young. You're seven years old. You have a life. You have friends. Now, all of a sudden, you you're learn you can't. Were you young enough? I mean, were you old enough to understand when they said you couldn't go to school? No. I thought I had a, you know, they had, in Germany they gave you a candy, a, Tutte, they call it, a, a thing with, uh, full of candy. And of course, I went to school in, in the uh, sort of Matrosen, that's a Navy outfit, went to school with my candy. Uh, I thought everybody did, because I was really segregated from the Gentile population, so to speak. Uh, and uh, so I didn't know anything was wrong. In fact, oh, I can tell you a terrible memory that I have, and I shared it with a couple other kids. Uh, for instance, we had a Hindenburg reunion, and there were a couple things. Uh, one of my friends said he had gone to Holland, and he saw the Germans, made a big mistake going to Holland, but he saw the Germans walking down the street, and he told his father, huh, they don't look so bad to me. You know, it's the same cook, and what, what, what are they going to do? Look how, how they're walking down the street. Another f older fellow said, we were just mad we weren't allowed to get, join the Hitler Youth. We, were, uh, we saw, and I'd look out the window and see the uh, uh, German uh, youth group walking down the street. Uh, I didn't, was too young to join anyway, but uh, older people, and they were just mad that they weren't allowed to join the Hitler Youth. Um, so I had really, and, and, but parents weren't that telling, didn't tell kids much. I didn't know there was anything bad going on in Germany. Oh, so the other embarrassing memory was, I hear about the An Anschluss, the Anschluss, the attachment of Austria and Germany, early of, in 1938. 
I hear it on the radio. I ran to my mother and I quickly looked at the map. And I ran to my mother all enthused. I said, look how much bigger Germany is now than it was. And she told me to shush. She shushed me. I thought she didn't hear properly. I said, look how we got Germany is now so much bigger. Isn't that great? Be quiet in German. So that's how they kept things from kids. The theory is in those days, you don't want to worry them. Right. Don't worry. So I knew nothing about uh, Hitler uh, being bad, uh, Germans being bad. Uh, I didn't know why we moved from Hindenburg to, from Leibniz to Hindenburg. Um, there they one time, I, I might have to say something about they put the German trooper in front of the door. Well, we had two doors to our store, and we put a sign above the trooper, use other entrance. You know, the trooper was in front of the store saying, do not deal with Jews. So we put a sign, they still had the guts to put a sign up, use the other door. And so, uh, it's strange how uh, the Jew German Jews did not wake up. My father woke up early enough because they could, I couldn't go to school. Other Jews didn't wake up until after Kristallnacht, November 9th, and they had trouble getting out. So what did he tell you when you moved? How did he explain that you were going to move to the United States? I don't really remember. We were going okay. to move to the United States. So it was you and your mom and dad and your sister. Yep, the four of us, that's it. Left my grandmother, great-grandmother. So what's going to happen to them? They're, my great-grandmother was 85. And a, the, the, uh, my mother's uh, babysitter went, stayed with the family, became like a family retainer, and she took care of my grandmother and great-grandmother. Great-grandmother died uh, of natural causes uh, in 1939. Grandmother, my mother's mother, also died. I suspect, well, I was never told, that she may have committed suicide. Just like one of his stepbrothers, I was going to say, committed suicide uh, in Hamburg. Uh, uh, and his other brother, uh, who was the editor, music critic for the Frankfurter paper, we couldn't get him out, to, couldn't get him a visa. It was too, too, we weren't rich enough to give him a visa. He went, they eventually were lucky enough, he went to a concentration camp, and if you had a visa to get out, they got a visa from Uruguay and lived in Uruguay for a number of years till he could come to the United States. No, another question? Okay. So, so you do remember, though, the trip over here? Oh, a little, so. yeah, the boat was nice. I played all the normal things on the boat. We went first class, obviously. Went first class all the way to St. Louis. And uh, so, so you get to St. Louis, and, and you're in school. So, do you, I, you had you didn't speak English? You had an accent. Um, did you feel slowly but surely? I learned as I went. That wasn't too difficult, I guess, for a seven-year-old and eight-year-old to learn English. And I went through first grade, and sometimes I'd, the the half-year system that was in effect in those years made it easier to get double promotions. And so, to, to skip 13 weeks of school or 15 weeks of school isn't that hard. And I'd be at the top of, near the top of the class, and they'd skip it. All of a sudden, I'd skip a half a year. How did your parents adjust to being here? Well, they had to learn English. They had to run a business. My father bought out his partner in a year or two. A uh, partner got tired of it, and so he bought him out. Uh, we were making pretty good money. Uh, in those days. Um, he went, but my parents worked seven days a week. My mother did the payroll on Sunday. My father went into the store to straighten up uh, the store and do advertising. My father believed in merchandise and advertising and got him into trouble at various times. But uh, that's sort of... Uh, and, and so then, as you got older, the, did they explain to you what, what had happened? In oh, well, life? how did I learn? Well, then I sort of learned, uh, whether it's at school, whether it's at the Y, uh, whether it was what they would... Sure, they, we, we talked about it because we knew uh, grandmother and grandmother and great-grandmother. I still remember all 
certain things about them. We used to have Friday night at their apartment. We had Shabbat and dinner. We had a Friday Shabbat dinner. She, they had a lot, I remember that apartment sort of well. I remember they had, she had a lot of uh, birds and they, were, they wouldn't face each other because they wouldn't talk facing to each other. Just piled sort of up in little cages. Uh, also, f my great grandmother was getting to be 84, 85. She had a horn that you had to yell into if you wanted to talk to her. And so I, she, she, uh, I'd go around to her this side and, and yell into her horn if I wanted to talk to her. But I had a very normal upbringing, uh, upper class, certainly an upper class family. Um, in, in Hindenburg. And did you go to shul? Did you go to synagogue or temple? I remember uh, going to Hindu a synagogue, which I think may have been, I don't know whether they call it reformed or, or what, it was, it was a modern, but I still remember, the holiday I remember the most was with the lula. Uh, uh, Purim. Purim, yeah, so I remember that one the most. Uh, I didn't go often, I don't believe. I don't think I went there often until I had to go during the daytime to go. And I walked to the synagogue. It wasn't that far away. In those days, uh, it was probably no, uh, but, uh, and that, that's why I said one time I was uh, accosted on the street. But uh, I remember where all the little the movie theater was. I saw in Germany, in Hindenburg, I, at the modern, very modern looking theater, which is, uh, I saw uh, uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and they had to hold the seat down for me because I didn't weigh very much. And I saw that, that's all I remember. I know where the ice cream store is, I know where the meat store is, the grocery store. Uh, and I d went back. Where uh, did you go back? I went back uh, about 90, Six. My wa wife died. By the way, I found my wife in Philadelphia, and my, uh, we, we dated for about two or three years. And then uh, I brought her to my, see my meet my parents. Uh, my father disapproved strongly because he didn't get married till he was maybe forty, and he says, "Well, how can you get married? You haven't made any money yet. When you're established, then you can get married." So he gave me a hard time. For at least for about a year, I got married Christmas uh, Day, 1952, uh, uh, when I graduated. Ran around and got myself a, uh, a nice a, 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 a deferment uh, to go to uh, join the Air Force. If I join the Air Force uh, and become an ECM man, electronic countermeasure officer. Uh, well, that was a better solution because I didn't have to, I could get forward to get married. Uh, and uh, so that's what I did. We was, I was in for about five years uh, until 1957 in the service. It, and I was stationed in Europe okay. uh, just by luck, really, in very western part of uh, Germany, Trier, near Luxembourg City. We so enjoyed you went our. Back to Germany. What? So you were in Germany. I was in Germany. I could still remember enough German in those days, and I still remember couldn't have, a, can't have a decent conversation, but I can still speak some German, and, and make a German understand. I think. Did what you I, go back at that point to any of where you, where you had? Lived? No, you weren't because that was Russia, okay. controlled that. Remember that was the way beyond the Iron Curtain. We had to fly. One day I got a flight into Berlin and just a. Uh, and spent one day in Berlin, West Berlin, but we weren't al allowed to even go into East Berlin, if, even if the Russians would have let us. We weren't allowed to be a tourist. There too much t uh, classified information in my head, apparently. Did, did people in the Army ask you, since obviously you probably still had some of that accent? And oh, of course German. they did. did they uh, want to know what Oh, they happened? knew. They knew. They knew everything. In fact, I was within the squadron, and I could bet the officers that I flew in an airplane before any of them ever did. You know, the majors and the colonels. Uh, our colonel was a uh, pilot in the RAF. Uh, but I, I did, I flew from London to Paris, as I said, before they did. So uh, 
uh, basically, uh, they all knew. Uh, I was, in fact, I was put in charge of certain little jobs, like pa uh, passing out the Christmas presents to the Germans or something like that. Or when they had some of the local people come in, I sometimes helped maybe do some translation for them. But, uh, and we could, uh, there was a great time that we spent a young married couple. We almost all had babies over there because Air Force babies cost about seven dollars. I had to pay for my wife's food while she was in the hospital. And that's so, every, so almost to, everybody you, had who children. Who was born over there? My oldest was born over there. That's my her name. second one, uh, Jeffrey. Jeffrey was born. He's now a physician, uh, ophthalmologist uh, in California. And my second one has taken over the, the business, what's sort of left of it, yeah. And what's... And the third one is... The second child's name is... Oh, Frank. And the third child is David. And he's down in, uh, in Dallas, Texas. And he's become very orthodox, extremely orthodox. He's coming up to visit me. We have to go to Simon Cohn's for food and double wrap it and, and so on. And, and, in uh, aluminum foil, and anyway, we we get along well, did nicely. Did you feel you were religious growing up? I mean, we I know. joined the temple at first. Okay, coming to town, my father wanted to be ethical society. Took me to a took us in there. Uh, my mother protested when I Easter when I brought home the Easter flowers, and she says, "No, we can't do that." And we went to Temple Israel with Mr. Isserman, Rabbi Isserman. And I was, I'm still with Temple Israel uh, to this day. Um, so all my kids got confirmed at Temple Israel. Two out of the three uh, also get bar mitzvahed. The third one, the Orthodox one, did not get bar mitzvahed till he went down to Lubbock, Texas, <laughs> after he got married. So, uh, and now he's the Orthodox one. But uh, basically, that's sort of the history of my family. My, Parents died in the 70s. My father died in 75, uh, and my mother died in 73, I think it is, 72. Did, did they ever talk to you about the injustice that was done, that they had to leave their home? Well, no, I, well, sure. Uh, we, we knew that, that it was uh, wrong, that we uh, had had to leave, you know, all, the, all our possessions except for the ones that we were able to move out. And if we would have waited another month or two, we wouldn't have had any of those. Uh, so we were among the lucky group. Uh, some of the professionals were lucky because they couldn't practice anymore. Where could they go? They, had, they got out early. And so basically uh, a good percentage of the Germans, you know, we were only uh, less than 1% of the German population, uh, maybe five, seven, eight hundred thousand. And I'd say that uh, relatively few were killed because they were more valuable to the Germans uh, as workers and as, uh, as than they were, and they and many of them were able to get out um, before the war really started in '41. Mm -hmm. So they were. Uh, that's one era that's on the map over there. So when did you decide that you wanted to talk about your experience? That's a good question because just like most. I didn't even go see uh, uh, the, the, uh, Schindler's List. I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to think about it. I didn't want to speak about it. And it was basically a friend of mine who lived through it and worked and became part of the Havara group that we're in. It sort of put the twist on me that, oh, you surely should be part of the Holocaust Museum. And it has, uh, all of a sudden, it has helped. The talking about it makes almost everything go away, especially since I didn't have anything that deep. I have a um, my cousin's wife it was in in in, in Auschwitz and in uh, Lotz. Uh, this friend was underground. This, uh, so uh, I now know a lot of the people, but uh, that's that's about. When I, so I really didn't do this till about 10, till about 10, 11 years ago. 
I did go volunteers for Israel. I went with my uh, with an, with a, with my friend uh, uh, to Israel to work on an artillery base packing. You know, I did that once. I went to uh, on a trip of Eastern Europe once. When in Krakow is very close to Hindenburg, 60 miles, maybe 100 kilometers. So I had made arrangements to get a car in uh, in Krakow and and drive to Hindenburg and to drive to Gleiwitz. My uh, Those cities were not damaged very much during the war at all because it was too far for the Allies to fly and bomb. And there wasn't maybe that much strategic stuff there, the coal mines, coal mining maybe and so on. And the Russians, by the time they got there, the war was essentially over, so they didn't burn and pillage. I mean, there was the rape of Berlin, but, uh, but there was not, not that much that I know. So both businesses were there as nice as could be. And so of what course- What did that feel like when you went back and saw those businesses? It was just sort of, in it was interesting. In fact, the man in the bookstore knew my name. I mean, uh, because Ms. Mendelssohn was an architect that had a, a following and uh, in the uh, California, there's a lady that's his biographer. And so she'd been to his store. And uh, so, uh, anyway, that's... We're going to just change tapes? No, no. no? You're, you I leaned think. over and you put your head right I leaned. Oh, I okay. thought I thought maybe I was running out of... No, no, you're... We, we still got time? 20 minutes left. Oh, we're good. Okay. We're good. Okay. Um, so did you start talking um, before you went back to Germany or after? Oh, uh, you mean I didn't talk about uh, my experience or anything about, uh, about this until I joined the Holocaust Museum. Okay, but, but when you joined the Holocaust Museum, had you already gone back to Germany? Yes, I went okay. on, this, uh, on this one trip. Uh, okay. So to you've been thinking about your, your heritage? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And now I've sort of... I talk about it during the... Okay, so tell me why you do the tours, why you became a docent. Well, I, I, last time I, that, that was because of Linda McFessel and Jerry Koenig. They're the two that work here and they, they just sort of pushed me into it. I'm easily pushed into things. And so we came and uh, we've contributed um, quite a bit to the, to the Holocaust Museum and uh, Again, became interested in it, and it really has been therapeutic to the extent that uh, I don't think that much about the past anymore, about there ever, you know. I think I may have thought more about it when I was young. Okay, so tell me again um, how important it's been for you to get involved with the museum. Well, that's what I say. It was nice for me uh, psychologically and uh, no longer pains me. I went to see the pianist, for instance, which was more brutal probably than the uh, uh, Schindler's List, and sat through that with, with, without being too torn to pieces, because it, you know, okay, that's what well, happened. Don't move in your chair, but tell me, tell me how coming to the St. Louis Holocaust Museum has helped you deal with everything. Well, I've been sort of, I've been uh, proud of being able to help to somehow spread the story uh, of what happened in those days and perhaps help educate people like, I, like we did this morning that probably, I didn't ask the question this morning, for instance, did you ever know a Jew? Because that class from Cahokia you know, I don't suspect that they ever met the Jew uh, in the recent years. I, I feel sort of bad about the fact, not only that, um, about the fact that the Jewish population in the small cities is almost decimated, uh, that the graveyards are, uh, you know, not, not being used anymore, I, uh, and that uh, uh, very few people know about uh, about Jews or very much about them. 
there's, I guess, good and bad about that. Uh, but uh, so this sort of fills the gap uh, of, uh, and the, the, uh, we're very happy about the trunk program, which we contributed. My sister wrote a couple of books, a little book, small books for young people. One is a, the first one she wrote, and that one we distribute uh, at the Holocaust Museum in the trunk showing is that where, uh, when the soldiers were gone. It's about a friend of hers in, in Albany, New York, who was given away uh, by his parents to a farm couple. Uh, the farm couple uh, taught, them, taught him to jump into the, uh, into the clothes hamper when a German came into to the, to the house. And basically he didn't know he was, he changed his name to Hans, and he didn't know he was Jewish until one day uh, at the end of the war, a couple come to the house and the farmer calls him in. He says, uh, this is your mother and father. You're going away with them. And he, and he cried and he says, what are you giving me away? And, uh, and they let, let him take the cat with him. And they went off to uh, Amsterdam and he, uh, uh, and uh, so uh, he then came, got to Albany, New York. Mm. And tell, right. tell me why you like to talk to the kids. The what? Tell me why you like to take the kids for the tour and talk to them. Well, like I say, uh, education is something that uh, is, is uh, I personally uh, feel it's important. Uh, I don't particularly get personal satisfaction out of it, except that I've now talked to 12 more people, uh, 15 more people, 20 more people, and maybe uh, things won't get bad again. Uh, sometimes we worry about that when, uh, would it, what, what could happen if, uh, you know, uh, the government changes in some way in this country. I'm, I'm never, I think most of us are not quite sure that it's ever going to be the same. It's always forever going to be the same for the Jews in this country. So maybe we're doing something to help. Um, so education is really important to you. Oh, absolutely, yes. And what lessons do you hope to teach these children about the Holocaust? Um, <clears throat> that they must be vigilant and try and avoid uh, prejudice in their lives and the lives of others. And uh, that's, I guess, all I can, uh, to be uh, friendly with everybody, and I have been in my life. Uh, I don't think I've ever been really uh, prejudicial against anybody. Uh, so these are things that's something that's expected of me. Uh, as I say, I'm not prejudiced against my son who became Orthodox. <laughs> all, my, all my kids did marry uh, Jewish gals, and uh, the Orthodox gal, I mean, and she wasn't Orthodox. They, they converted from Reform to Orthodox just eight years ago, seven, eight years ago, after they'd been married 10, 12 years. So anyway, that's sort of... Do you have, do you have grandchildren? I have, I have five grandchildren. I lost my wife in, uh, in 1995, and I was fortunate to find uh, s someone who, act down in Dallas, I was sent down there by some friends of ours here in St. Louis to meet her, and she happens to be an ex-St. Louisan. She knew my sister, she knew my parents, uh, she's four years younger than I am, and what's a 15-year-old boy doesn't talk very much to an 11-year-old and tries to get as far away as possible. So I really, frankly, don't remember her from when she was maybe 12 and I was 16. And I don't remember her when I met her in St. Louis. Actually, our path crossed when I came back from the service in 1957. Carol is her name. Uh, and. Uh, and so she, uh, 
uh, was, a, as I say, uh, I knew her. Our paths crossed twice, and we've had a nice eight years together. And your, your first wife's name was? Louise Gerson. And now, was Louise American, or was she? She was American, yeah. She was, uh, I guess, uh, a da a daughter of an American also, but uh, her aunts, uh, at least one of them, two of them were born in Poland and came to this country turn of the century, sometime after the turn of the century, probably. So she's, uh, that was her, and she passed away from cancer in 1995, I think. So we had 42 years together, so that was. And so what, what what really would you like to say to your children and grandchildren about your life? What would I? Oh. Well, uh, the, one of them is graduating from college. Uh, my oldest is graduating from college December 20th. Uh, they're all, the kids uh, went to college. Uh, one went to the Mizzou, and two went to Washington University, and, and uh, so education is, you know, it's very important. Uh, we're, uh, and, uh, and I tell, tell them I prefer that their children be Jewish, and that they're um, married Jewish. I realize now that that's not always possible, but uh, educating them uh, educating the grandchildren to be Jewish is, is, I think, good enough. And actually, it's turning the country around to, to a great extent. All of a sudden, the population of us Jews is not going down because we are making plenty of converts. And uh, look in the Wall Holocaust Museum is, uh, is well, an example. Do you, do you feel that's, that's an important lesson? I think uh, being Jewish is good. And uh, I, I enjoy it. I think, uh, uh, I think it's important to uh, be part of uh, uh, the Jewish community. Uh, I think it's important for my, I'd like to see that my, uh, I have some great grandchildren in the Jewish community. I, I've been successful in keeping all my grandchildren in, in the Jewish community. So, uh, Hopefully, the next generation will also will also be in that community, and that they'll have a pleasant life in the United States. Well, because I saw, I mean, you were teaching the kids in there about anti-Semitism. Probably a lot of those kids really hadn't, like you said, hadn't met someone Jewish, don't understand anti-Semitism. They under well, that's absolutely right. So. Uh, uh, um, I don't know what to exactly say about that. Are we, are we well, fostering elite, well, elitism? Well, I think what I want you to say is, because when I show you, know, you walking with the kids through the museum, that it's important for you to teach them. Yeah, I, well. So and that's tell me about teaching them about being Jewish and anti-Semitism. Um, or you can just say it's important that I teach. Oh them. yeah, it's important to, that that we teach as many as possible. Uh, that we Jews are pretty much like everybody else. One of the things I did tell them uh, when we were looking at the Torah, for instance, um, I did tell them that Jews believe in education, and that that is was, was they and they listened to that. I got a kick out of that. That, uh, that Jews went to school, uh, were educated, at least the men were pretty well educated always. They always knew at least how to read that, the, the Torah. And uh, so education has always been important to my father. I knew it was important to my father. And we always watched the grades of the kids and the grades of grandchildren. And, uh, and we stress uh, education. And so we, I try and pass that on when I have a class like uh, all black kids here that I, African-Americans, that, that uh, 
education and getting their education is probably the most important thing. And the fact that I repeated to them that my father said education is something you can never lose and never be taken away from you. So, so you feel that having the St. Louis Holocaust Museum is important? Oh, I've gone to Holocaust museums all over the country now when we travel. We, for, in California, in uh, Dallas, in Houston. Houston has a very nice one too. Dallas doesn't. Uh, New York, or we went to the Washington one not that many years ago. Uh, but this is actually a nice compact. I, I like this one as well as any that I've seen um, because it's compact and tells a, 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 just about the whole story very, very well. And sometimes I end up talking more about one thing than the other, but uh, because we basically have an hour. And now that the tapes exist, I think that's very good too. I quite often come on Sunday because I like to just talk in general to people and I get them the tape. If they, they don't want the tape, I might follow them around a little bit and tell them something. So, uh, but I just am amazed at the number of uh, people that aren't Jewish that come here, especially on Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, I should say, uh, and uh, can sometimes, the, the husband, or sometimes they stay there for two or three hours, so that they read almost everything on the wall. Um, I could make docents out of them. <laughs> yeah, so okay. do you get gratification? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. I told you. I sort of like coming on Sunday just talking to older p people, and p contemporaries of mine, and maybe their kids that are with them. So uh, anyway, I enjoy doing that. But I get satisfaction out of doing anything uh, out of that. So, um, okay. so thank you very much okay. for having anything me. Anything else you want to I, I haven't, I can't think of anything else, but you poor people are going to have such a tough time editing no, this no, thing. No, it'll be fine. Because I had it jumped around so much. That's okay. No, I think by, by you finally got me to just, say just, just about everything. Just one last thing. I think okay. what I just want to say is the fact that, that, and I want you to mention how you were lucky that you came here with your mom and dad and your sister. You, your first wife, your three children, your second wife, your grandchildren. So just kind of do a summary yeah. for me. Well, I'm no question about it. I've been lucky to be in this country. Uh, like I say, I've had a uh, first wife I found in Philadelphia. We've had three children. Uh, and uh, they all been educated, all married, uh, nice nice uh, daughter-in-laws, and uh, now I have uh, five grandchildren. My wife, my, uh, my second wife has also has five guys. So be between us, we have 10 grandchildren. Um, and uh, anyway, we enjoy uh, uh, the success we've had in this country, not only uh, in, in living here, but also in, in, in building uh, roots and building uh, 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 for instance, I'll tell you one more thing. If you put it in, or it don't it make any difference. I recently went to a, 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 re, a reunion of my 42nd TAC Recon Squadron that I was with in Germany. And I was very lucky there because it was a new squadron, all young officers, about 100 young officers, pilots, ECM people, and, uh, and uh, weather people all coming together about the same time, 19, we didn't even have airplanes at that time, in 1954, uh, uh, we were there about three or four years, and, and uh, I chose to get out, many of them stayed in, and we started the mailing list when I got my computer, I started the mailing list, and so uh, this uh, resulted in a, a biannual um, a reunion, and so I just came back off one, and down to fewer people now. There are, some have passed away, some are invalids, so can't travel anymore. But it was it's sort of nice to have built another family. And it was nice to have built a base, uh, basically a nice Gentile family. 
uh, one of one of the guys lived in Illinois, and he's coming comes to St. Louis about once a year because his granddaughter is going to Webster and music. So anyway, thank you very much for having That's me. Good. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. That's great. Thank you.